Good morning. I thank God for um, our worship team. God has gifted us with some very talented musicians, but there's a big difference between being a talented musician and being a worshiper. And, and I thank God that he has given us worshipers. Yes. Um, if you have your Bible, um, we're, we're going to kind of jump around a bit today, but open to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to start off over there. <coughs> Uh, before we get started, we have uh, a lot of people in this church that have been fighting this <coughs> upper respiratory tract infection and sinus problems and coughing and hacking. So if you're one of those, put your hand up. Oh my gosh. All right. So look, look around. Don't keep your hands up. Look around. So if you're sitting close to somebody that has your hand up, don't move away. <laughs> Reach up, put your hand on them. We're going to pray over them, all right? <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you are sovereign. You are supreme. You are all-powerful. There is nothing that is beyond your reach. So, Father, I lift up those that are fighting this, this disease, this sickness, whatever it is, Father. Uh, some that are struggling with pneumonia, some with bronchitis, uh, some with just feeling the crud. I'm asking, Father, for your touch unto healing, that we would praise and glorify your name. We ask this, Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, for those of you that weren't here last week, we talked about <coughs> holiness. We talked about being holy as, as God is holy. Understanding that it is not anything of ourselves, that it comes directly from God. It's, it's a, a beautiful exchange whereby He takes all of our sin and replaces it with His righteousness. And He takes us out of the profane, the common, the ordinary, and He moves us into holiness that only he has. And over the course of the last few weeks, I've been kind of pondering this idea um, <coughs> judging. And there's been a lot of talk about, oh, you know, Jesus said, don't judge. So we're not to judge. And I see this laid out in an appeal to not deal with sin. And I, I want to tell you, that's a lie. No, Jesus did say, do not judge. Matthew chapter 7 says, by the measure you judge, you will be judged. And so, I'm not saying that part's the lie. As a matter of fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, I, I believe Jesus is making very clearly, don't judge according to your self-righteous standards. Because keep in mind, this is the same place that he talks about doing your, your giving in secret and your fasting where no one will see you. So that your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I think he's talking about self-righteous judgment, where we get our nose up in the air because somebody doesn't live up to our standards. But we have a, a problem um, because hermeneutics, which is just a fancy way of saying Bible study, hermeneutics tells us that all Scripture is interpreted in light of all Scripture. So in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is saying... Judge not, lest thou be judged. And by the measure you judge, it will be judged to you. 
But then in John chapter 7, Jesus cautions us to make right judgments. Uh-oh. Well, how can we make right judgments if we're not supposed to judge? So what I want to do today is I want to kind of look and put into perspective judging. Because we have a huge problem in the church. We have this huge array, this, this broad spectrum, where on one end, nobody is judged for anything, and grace is cheapened to the point where it enables and even encourages sin. And then we go to this other side, where judgment rules supreme, but it's based on self-righteousness. And it's based on our understanding of what should be judged. And we see this with um, the Westboro Baptist Church and the things that they do. And, and we, we see it in a lot of churches. Um, so, where are we going? Um, there's, there's two things that we need to look at. First, there are disputable matters. Okay? Now, St. Augustine, this is one of my favorite quotes, you've heard me say it before, said that in the essentials, we must have unity. We must all agree. In the non-essentials, we have liberty. But in all things, we have charity. We love at all times. Okay? And what we are talking about today is we need to define between the essentials and the non-essentials. And we really get into trouble here. Because a lot of times, A leads to B, and B leads to C. And so we assume that A must be equal to C. Uh, well, mathematically that might work. But in the economy of God, sometimes that leads to problems. Because God very definitely laid out A, which apparently and very clearly might lead to B, but then we make this broad jump to C, and all of a sudden, we're making our stand on C. Here I stand! And God is nowhere in it. But he led me to this point. Yeah, and you jumped off on your own and made a stand for something that God has not clearly defined and laid out in his word. Wow, it's really weird to be up that high. <laughs> <clears throat> so, disputable matters. These are not essentials. Okay? These are things that Scripture does not clearly indicate one way or the other how it should be done. Okay? Scripture makes no mention of how, as a pastor, I should dress. Okay? Some churches make a point of contention with this. Okay? Some churches will have a real problem if a gentleman would get up to speak and not wear a jacket and a tie. Some churches would have a real problem if he did have a jacket and a tie. Some churches require that women wear skirts, not pants. Um, some churches require this or that in order to be on the stage. What does scripture say about those kind of things? Well, I know Paul writes to Timothy and says to dress modestly. What's dressing modestly? Well, you need to cover the knees. Well, it wasn't that long ago you had to cover the ankles. It wasn't that long ago you weren't supposed to show your wrists. And then maybe not your elbows. And now... Shoulders is questionable. It's a disputable matter. It's something that God has not clearly defined in Scripture. Okay? So in 1 Corinthians, um, we'll, we'll get to chapter 5 in just a minute. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about, don't, don't be so concerned. Um, let, let me just check my reference here. I want to make sure I got this right. <coughs> yep, now I gotta look. <coughs> Sorry, it's not seven. 
9. Um, disputations about food. <coughs> should you eat the meat? Should you not eat the meat? Well, what's the answer? Well, it's up to you, right? If God has given you a piece about eating the meat, then it's absolutely okay for you to eat the meat. But if it causes a trouble with your conscience, then don't eat the meat. But where's the rule of consideration in this? The rule of consideration is, if I'm okay with eating meat, and you're not, then I don't eat meat with you. Okay? It's, it's the rule of preference. We prefer each other ahead of ourselves. Okay? So disputable matters, Scripture really doesn't define how it should be. It leaves it open to interpretation. And, and I believe it, open, it leaves it open to your personal conscience. There are certain things I don't do. Okay? I just don't. Okay? I don't drink alcohol. Do you know why? I don't like it. I, I don't have a problem with people drinking alcohol. Scripture doesn't make any reference to not drinking alcohol. What it does make reference to is don't be drunk. So, if you have a glass of wine or you have your beer, uh, we used to have a, a thing of beer in our refrigerator for whenever Christie's father would come out because he, whatever reason, he liked moose drool. <laughs> uh, to me, that right there would turn me off from wanting to drink it. But every time he came out, he wanted to get moose drool. So we would have moose drool in the refrigerator for him. Okay? I don't drink it because I don't like it. Okay? I have no spiritual compunction one way or the other, whether I should or whether I shouldn't. I just don't like it. Okay? I don't drink coffee for the same reason. I don't like it. Okay? Now, that's not to say that you should or shouldn't because that's something that ultimately is between you and God's spirit. Because I believe with all of my heart that for some people drinking alcohol would be wrong. For some people drinking coffee might be wrong. That's between you and God. I cannot make that determination up until this point. <coughs> does it cause sin? Okay. And this is where judgment comes in. Okay? This is something we don't like in the body of Christ. We are called, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read a, a little passage here. We are called to judge because God is looking for a spotless bride. Okay? So I'm going to pick up in verse 9. We're going to read down through this. Um, Paul writing, he says, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or of the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging others? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Okay, so here, here's a difficult thing for us to find a good balance for. This is why I believe that any time that there's an issue of judgment, it has got to be bathed, saturated in prayer. Okay? Because it's so easy for us to jump from point A to point C. Okay? From God's very clearly defined word and his will to my will and my preference. So, Paul starts off and he says, you know, I wrote to you, he's, he's uh, speaking about a, a previous letter, not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now this was probably uh, as a result of the uh, Jerusalem Council, but Paul is saying, you know, 
don't associate with these people. And then he clarifies, I'm not talking about the people of the world. Okay, so here is a very clear line of demarcation that Scripture is giving to us. Don't waste your time judging the people in the world. Okay? God's already judged them. He's got it well in hand. He doesn't need your help. Okay? Don't bother judging them. He says, if you were to not associate with these people, you wouldn't be able to associate with anyone in the world. God would have to take you out of the world. So he says, uh, verse 11, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. The, the brother there is a Delphoi. That, that can be brother or sister, depending on the context. It means sibling. Okay? So, brother or sister. So anyone who is professing the name of Christ who claims to be Christian and yet does these things is under judgment. And not only are they under God's judgment, but they have to be under ours as well. Why? Because God requires a spotless bride. Now, this can, can lead to a number of issues. First, um, we have an order of church discipline that needs to be followed. This is something that Jesus laid out for us. Okay? When you find that there is a brother in sin, you go to the brother and you confront them in love. Okay? Now I'm going to back up a step before we go through this process. The whole point of everything we do is that they might turn in repentance and receive forgiveness. That's the whole point of what we do. Not so they act like me. We want them to repent before God and receive His forgiveness. That their relationship with God might be right. Not so they'd be like me. Okay? So, we go to the brother or sister. We confront them. In love. Everything we do is driven by love. If you are not absolutely concerned, convicted about their position in eternity, it's probably best you not go. You might need to bring it to one of the leaders in the church and, and get their insight on this. Okay? Hopefully, you've got the maturity that you can go and deal with this first. Go, you deal with the brother or sister. They refuse to listen. Okay? Okay? What's the next step? Scripture says you take a believer with you and you go and you confront the person again. Here's the issue. This very clearly is sin. Scripture very clearly warns us against this kind of behavior. They refuse to repent. Then there is a third step where you bring that person in front of the body, present what is going on, and if they still refuse to repent, you put them out of the fellowship. We hate that. We hate that. And, and probably for noble reasons. We don't want anyone to be put out of the fellowship, but also probably for ignoble reasons. How embarrassing is that? Okay, But who told us to do this? Jesus, Matthew chapter 18. He's the one that lays out the principle whereby the church is disciplined. How can we do any of this if there is not a measure of judgment to begin with? Okay, The judgment is established first by the principle and the foundation of God's word. Okay? Now there's a, there's a lot of you guys. You do stuff different than the way that I would do it. Okay? And as far as a person to person, I would probably go, yeah, I wouldn't do it that way. But really, it's not my business. You, you know, if it works for you, great. If it doesn't work for me. But that's not a confrontational issue within the church. 
okay, when we are in the church and we see sin, it has got to be dealt with. As a matter of fact, it's got to be dealt with right to the point. Scripture even forewarns us that if it's a leader in the church, do it publicly. Correct them publicly that others would take note so that they might not sin. We can have no accommodation, there can be no accord with sin in the body of Christ. We can't accept it, period. We can't embrace it. We can't just let it lie. It's got to be dealt with. We're a private people. I don't like people knowing my business. Okay? Last week I shared with you some of the areas that I'm struggling with. Okay? The band note temper. When that temper goes off the way that I treat specifically Christy and how I'm really working, God is building in me a, a new pattern of behavior. Okay? Because the old one didn't work. The old one failed. The old one was antithetical to being a Christian. Antithetical means just it, it's opposed to. It's opposite of. Okay? So God has been changing me so that I can act in a way that would be Christ-like. Okay? So there's the first part. I have got, you guys have to be aware of what I'm struggling with so that you can step in and help me. Sin thrives in the dark. It grows. It matures. It repopulates in the dark. Okay? But when it's exposed to the light, it shrivels. Okay? So, if we have sin and it's in the church, it needs to be exposed so that it can be gotten rid of so that the body can begin healing itself. This takes judgment. Okay? Now, there are places where it may be an issue of immaturity and not really sin. You just don't know better. That's what teaching is for. Okay? So, if we are to have a healthy body, first, there has to be confession. We did that. We saw a little bit of that last week in the service. We saw people that were sharing the areas that they were struggling with. Um... It is God's plan to correct that. And if need be, you suffer a little bit of embarrassment for a while so that that can be rooted out and cleaned out. The end result being a right relationship first with God and then with the body of Christ. Okay? So... What are the indisputable matters? Well, we have lists. We have several lists throughout Scripture. Uh, I just read here in, in 1 Corinthians 5, here's some indisputable matters. The sexually immoral, the greedy, idolaters, revilers, drunkards, swindlers. Does anybody have a different translation there that, that changes revilers to something else? Somebody with the NIV or the NASB, just read me that list. Sexually immoral or greedy, idolater or slanderer, drunkard or swindler. Slanderer. A, a reviler is someone who uses hate speech. I'm not talking about the stuff you see in the news. They just have nothing good to say about anybody. Okay? They're always mouthing off bad stuff about people. Okay? So here, here's a list. These are things that we need to watch for. The sexually immoral, the greedy. Uh-oh. The greedy? Really? Yeah, God doesn't like that. God, God is opposed to us being greedy. He doesn't like it. Matter of fact, God wants you to hold everything you hand with an open hand. 
everything that he's given you. Okay. Corey Ten Boom uh, made a, a comment once. She said that I have learned to hold things loosely in my hand because I don't like the pain of him taking them from me. <clears throat> hold them loosely so that he can take them as needed. Don't let anything come between you and God. Hold it open-handed, okay? Greedy. An idolater. That's, that's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Idolatry. Do we have idolatry today? You betcha. You betcha. Matter of fact, we dress it up and call it different names, but it's still worshiping something other than God. Number one in America, I would have to say, is probably money. But it could be sex. Because both of those things drive off of each other. I mean, they want to sell you a car, they sell you sex. They want to sell you beer, they sell you sex. They want to sell you pretty much anything, they sell you sex. Okay? Those are gods. Okay? And if you're going to bow down and worship them, you are an idolater. Okay? So, idolater, a reviler, a slanderer, somebody who badmouths people, a drunkard, a swindler. Con man. What did, what did the NIV say for swindler? Swindler. Said swindler also. Does everybody know what a swindler is? Con man? Cheat. Somebody, yeah, cheat. Um, you know, back in um, the early days of our marriage, Christy and I used to play cards with uh, uh, friend, friends of ours that were a couple. Um, Darren and I share the same birthday. And when we were in college together, his mom kind of adopted me. He's from Oklahoma. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if you ever think of Oklahoma and you picture a person, you're probably picturing Darren. Okay? He is proud to be an Okie from Muskogee. And he is from Muskogee. And, and he just thinks being Oklahoman is the greatest thing in the world. And we would play cards and we would play um, spades. And Darren and I were always a team, and, and Christy and Darren's wife, Jana, were always a team. Darren and I always won. Always. Every game. Because we <laughs> cheated. <laughs> Darren and I used to have competitions to see which of us could double deal. Or bottom deal. Or stack the deck better than the other one. And the, the girls would just be talking about all the stuff. And he and I are trading cards back and forth right in front of them. And, and we won every single game. And this went on for like a year. And then I told my wife. And she got all holy and sanctimonious. And of course, I got defensive. Oh, come on, it's just a game of cards. There wasn't anything involved. You didn't have to wash my truck. <laughs> and then she talked about cheats. <sighs> now, God doesn't like cheats. <sighs> you really think God cares about a game of cards? Yep. I don't cheat anymore. I don't cheat anymore. Um, part of it is because Darren and Jenna are no longer married and they're still in Oklahoma. But mostly because God just tells me he doesn't like it. Winning shouldn't be that important to me. Okay. Um, so no more swindling for Glenn. I take my lumps. I lose at cards a whole lot more often than I win. <laughs> Um, so a swindler, he says an interesting statement right at the end, he says not even to eat with such a one. Do you understand what he's saying there? <coughs> Don't even fellowship with them. Don't invite them into your house. Don't go to their house if you're invited. Now let me add a caveat, because looking at this in light of Matthew 18, 
This has got to be someone that is unrepentant. Okay? Not someone that's struggling. Because we all have areas of weakness that are particular to us. Where we stumble. Get those out in the open. Start working on them. Don't hide them. Don't think that you can take the enemy on by yourself. God has orchestrated the body to be there to support one another. Don't try and handle them on your own. Get it out in the open. Confess it. That way it's exposed. It loses a lot of its power when it's exposed. And then you have people that can come alongside you and help you. Okay? Don't even fellowship with them. Verse 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Well, we don't have anything to do with judging outsiders. Out, outside of what? The body. Outside of the church, which is the body of Christ. Okay? Verse uh, 12 going on, it says, Is it not those in, inside the church whom you are to judge? It's a rhetorical question. Yeah, of course it is. Verse 13, God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Okay? Now this, this whole thing is set up because in chapter 5, the Corinthian church has embraced a sinner along with the sin. A man who was sexually immoral is being welcomed in the church. The sin is being allowed to sit there. It's not being dealt with. Okay? Paul even goes so far as to say, I've already removed the person in my heart. As far as I'm concerned, they're gone. This is one of those things we have to be cautious of. We love the sinner because we all stumble in many ways. Christ loves the sinner. That's why he went to the cross. We reject the sin. We reject the sin. We have to reject the sin. We can't accept it. We can't allow it. Because if you leave sin alone, what will happen? It'll just grow. It'll grow. Okay? Deal with it when you first find it. Root it out. Get it out from among you. Okay? There are certain matters that are indisputable. Galatians chapter 5 makes a whole list of the works of the flesh, those things that are in opposition to the Spirit of God. Colossians chapter 3 gives us another list. These are all things, these are all areas that we should be leery of, that we need to be cautious about. But if these things are in our church and we don't confront them, two things happen. First, we are allowing someone to be entangled in their sin. And that is not something Christ wants. Second, we are allowing indirectly for sin to thrive in our body, in the body of Christ. Okay? It needs to be dealt with. It needs to be rooted out. It needs to be done away with. And if the person will not let go of their sin, then we have to disfellowship them. Why? Because we hate them? No, absolutely not. Because we love them. Because they need to be removed from the umbrella, the covering of the church. They need to be turned over to Satan. Why? That they would see that life without Christ stinks and they would turn and come back. That they would have to get to the point where the misery of their sin far outweighs the joy of that sin and they want to get rid of it. So then when the person comes back, what do we do? We check to make sure the sin is being dealt with. If that's the case, we welcome them back. Okay? Now, I believe, honestly, there are different procedures for different people. I think some people need someone to walk beside them for a while. Uh, I am a, aware personally of an issue 
where a pastor was, was caught in a sexual sin that had been ongoing for over a year, and he confessed to the church, and his confession consisted of, basically, he was sorry he got caught. Okay? He stepped down for a period of time to, to um, get things right with his wife, to make things right with the church, to get his relationship with God right, but after about three weeks, he said, I'm good, Let me, I'm, I want to teach again. And when the church said, whoa, 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 we, we haven't even worked this out in the body yet, and you want to come back. He got frustrated, and he left and started a new church. Okay? Honestly, I don't think that man ever had any intention of dealing with his sin. I think he would have been just as content if he could have swept that under the rug and just kept going. And that, that makes me very concerned for that pastor. Because where does that put his relationship with God? And, and you mentioned, and his congregation. This is why those who lead are judged much more strictly. James 3 cautions us that those who teach must be judged more strictly. Okay? Because we don't want to propagate our error. So, we are in a time, politics. That's when you get to see the dirty diaper of a nation. Okay? And it's ugly. But I want to caution you, as Christians, don't confuse your politics with your faith. Okay? Faith comes first. Politics come after. Hopefully... The design should be that your faith dictates your politics. But like I said last week, there's a lot of things that our faith doesn't really address in politics. God doesn't say how much money our budget should allot for self-defense versus education. Okay? So there's, there's things there that, that really that's going to be up to you. But don't allow yourself to be drawn into the garbage that comes along with politics. Okay? Don't allow yourself to get into these, these tizzies, these emotional upsets. Look, God is in control. Okay? Our God decides who leads. Our God does. Every one of you, if you are of age, should get out there and vote. I believe that's something that not only is a privilege given to the United States of America all of it, those citizens, but it's also responsibility. And I think you need to look at the candidate beyond, are they going to vote for, are they going to do the things you want? Where do they stand? Where are they morally? What is their belief system? Everyone that runs for political office is a Christian. Every single one of them. We've never had a president yet that wasn't a Christian. Okay? But you can tell by history that a lot of them weren't. Okay? So don't, don't get caught up in a lot of the stuff that goes on. We have to make right judgments. Okay? And the judgment comes off of the truth that is God's word. That's where we stay. Don't allow yourself to be swayed by popular opinion, by a particular party, by whatever. Check it in light of God's word. Stand fast. And pray. Pray, 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 pray. Don't give up praying. Okay, so that's outside the body, inside the body. Hey, man, if you are professing Christ, it is my job as a brother in Christ to come alongside of you if I see you struggling. It is your job as a brother or sister in Christ to come alongside me if you see me struggling. Okay, twice in the last six or eight years, I've had someone that had to come to me and, and correct something that was going on. That I, to be honest with you, I had just kind of become cold to. I hadn't really even realized what was going on. And when they confronted me, ouch. Man, it's like that deep bruise. Somebody comes up and pokes it. Hey, stop that. That hurts. But when I heard what they were saying and I could get past my pride, which, which took some doing because, you know, I don't want anybody telling me that I'm in sin. When I did that, God opened my eyes and I was like, wow, 
how I had fallen from where I thought I was to where I was actually living. Set, set the pride aside. Let them come alongside you. Let them help you. Okay? Do this in love, driven by love, because you are concerned for the person, not because they don't do it the way you do, not because they don't talk the way you do, they, they maybe preach in jeans or whatever, but because you are concerned where they're at in their relationship with God. Okay? Judge. Absolutely, we are called to judge in the body, not outside. In the body. Okay? <clears throat> we judge with right judgment. <clears throat> Set your hearts and your minds on God. Press in hard after Him. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't cease. You go until that moment He calls you home. That's when you get a rest. Okay? Father, I bless you this morning. I thank you, God, for the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, for a body of believers that will come alongside and help, that will encourage and even exhort. I ask, Lord God, that you would set in our hearts and minds a hunger for you, a thirsting for you. Father, that we would not be content with anything less than you. I ask, Father, that you would accomplish your purposes in us, and through us. Help us, fathers, to be tools that are fit for your hand. We thank you, Jesus, that you have made a way where we can become so much more than we could do on our own. That sin can no longer lay claim to us. But we have victory because of your blood. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being that convicting voice that warns us, that cautions us, that directs us. We ask, Lord God, that you would accomplish your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>